So, hi, welcome everybody. We are now um, continuing with the talk by Kai Denker. Um, Kai is currently um, making his, um, I don't know, PhD, right? Um, he's yeah, studying in philosophy, history, and uh, informatics. So this will rather be not a completely technical talk, but more focus on history and yeah, the importance of stuff that happened. Um, well, yes. Um, so yeah, we'll just start. Please give a, a warm round of applause for Kai and go. Thank you for this kind introduction and welcome to my talk which was titled Does Hectorism Matter? And as you may know this talk is part of the track uh, Society and Politics. And in fact my talk will deal with society, politics and even hacking. But Does it work? No. Sollen wir das dann nehmen einfach? Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a talk about history and in particular the history of hacking and its impact on lawmaking. And to be honest, I'm not really a historian. My background is, as you have heard, in computer science and in philosophy. And I mostly work on the philosoph philosophical theories of digital movements, for example, hacktivism. So the history of the digital sphere, that's a history that is still extremely short, um, is, is an important basis of my work, but not its main focus. And um, as a basis for my work, I need to find examples for hacktivism that, that matters, or mattered at all, if there is such a thing. Okay, so this is my motivation. I want to know if hacktivism matters. And to answer this question, first I have to know what hacktivism means. And uh, my uh, preliminary definition is any kind of political activism that is performed by hacking. Um, that is not digital activism, that is what we do in blogs or Twitter or something like that. It's precisely connected to hacking. And the second uh, uh, thing we have to know is when something matters. And that is when it has any impact outside the hacker movement itself. For example, in the political sphere, or in society, and law, uh, and so on. So, what I'm going to do. First, um, I want to describe, uh, before I describe the BTX hack itself, I will give you an idea what, what historians actually do. Um, I want to give you an impression what this um, discipline is all about, how it works, and which questions are addressed in history and how the uh, discipline itself developed very shortly. And uh, after this crash course through history as a science, I will talk about the image of technology in the 1980s. It was when the computer age was uh, about to leave its infancy and still was an alien fantasy uh, that was far, far away for most people. Then I will give you an impression of the Bildschirm Text System, BTX, for short, um, which was an epitome of large centralized technology in the 1980s. And finally, I will focus on the computer crime lawmaking in the 1980s to answer our question. Okay, what do historians do and why? History as a science developed in the late 19th century and uh, in the traditional view of, of history, it had to tell how it really was. And that meant uh, mostly to, to reconstruct events and events in a political sense. But nowadays we have a broader scope in this uh, subject. As a contemporary view of, of history is to for, uh, foremost to have more theory, to question our own concepts, and to have a shift from, from mere events to power relations, and to, to question the role of history itself uh, in producing legitimacy and identity. Uh, for example, um, history serves as, as um, a tool for, for building founding myth or to, to um, legitimize territor ter territorial demands, for example. Um, and this is something that we have to, to question when we, we deal with history. Okay, how does histo historical research work? First, an idealized and generic idea of it. First of all, of course, you need a research question. And this research question uh, defines What's your interest in literature, archives, and sources? Um, and when you have found literature and, and sources, you have to think about this. And of course, it's an incremental process. 
um, when you have uh, done uh, enough uh, incre uh, incremental uh, steps in this process, you can start in theory idolized writing and then publish your paper, and then it becomes literature for history itself. Okay, this method is of course uh, highly subjective. We have, uh, first of all, uh, the question, what is a source? How do we evaluate it? Um, then we have to know which literature there is, is it re relevant, is it reliable, and which interpretation is appropriate. And uh, this appropriateness is, uh, of interpretations is where the subjective bias of history, which is mostly conservative, by the way, is most obvious. But let's go to uh, some real history and try to, to find out how it works in reality. First of all, we have problems in finding funding for exotic research questions. That's, today it's much easier, but a few, uh, a few years ago you had uh, much more problems in getting funding for, for example, for, for gender history or something. And nowadays it's much more easy. And for example, uh, my focus on the 1980s is something that is uh, more or less trendy since, since a few years, but still very new to history. And the second problem is there is often very little, little, little sorry, literature for your topic you are dealing with, so you have to find it, and mostly there is nothing. And um, when, you, when you, for example, are dealing with, with uh, hacktivism, you find a lot of, um, his, of, of literature written by hacktivists him, themselves. Um, but you can't, can't really use this as, um, activist literature as, as literature in a scientific sense. There are sources. But when you're going to sources, you have, first of all, the problem to, to get to archives. And this is the accessibility of archives. For example, when I started um, um, searching for, for sources for this topic, I asked the telecom if they had still left something about the BTX system. And I received an answer uh, the other day, and it was just, oh, we don't support research. <laughs> OK, thank you. And, and I wrote, wrote the, um, the Bundesnetzagentur uh, to, to find out if they had something, and they didn't answer at all. But uh, some guy called me um, on the phone from the Fernmeldetechnische Zentrale in Darmstadt. There was a technical operator of uh, BTX. And uh, when I told what, was, uh, what I was looking for, he said, he says, oh, BTX was the only system that has never been hacked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was a quite interesting uh, phone call I had, but it was a dead end, too. Okay, so uh, when you finally made it to, to find some archives who have uh, material for you, in this case it is, of course, uh, the, uh, the archive of the German Bundestag, you have to, to, find, uh, to use this, uh, sources and to question their reliability. And we will see that uh, even sources from the Bundestag, uh, from the Parliament's archive, are a bit tricky. To work. And finally, if you have uh, done all these things and can have thought, uh, think enough, thought enough and uh, started writing, you always have to keep the reader in mind. And that means you have to follow dominant trends and discourses that are shaping your research too. For example, uh, when I was working on this, the first idea was to, um, to write a paper on, on uh, BTX. BTX. And then uh, the editor asked me to expand this paper with, with consumer culture. And there was almost no sources for consumer culture on BTX. And so I decided to, to expand the scope of the paper in, uh, to, to hacktivism in particular. And uh, then they started, oh, that's, that's quite interesting, but we want uh, in, an introduction to the history of the CCC. So I had to revise the paper again and again. Um, but now it's hopefully done. I hope so, it's, it's peer review. I have no idea if it gets us accepted. So next step, we have found sources, but what is a source at all? And the source is, simply put, every authentic object that tells us something about the past. And um, we have, of course, some constraints with that. For, first, no? Yeah. We have to understand the source. It's not trivial. We have, for example, a language problem. There are many sources from ancient times um, that we, we can't read because uh, the language is just lost. It's, I think the language is called linear A, and we have no idea to translate it. Another problem is it must be yeah, comprehensible, and you must be able to talk about it. This is, for example, a problem if you're dealing with source code. When you uh, try to use source code as a, uh, as a source um, for, for history, 
you get some problems that your reader won't understand it. Um, I try to, to um, give an idea of um, hacking culture in the early 80s in the paper and described uh, a part of the first Datenschleuder where Wal Holland demanded to, to program a, a crime, a program which output equals a source code to, to, uh, get, uh, to become a member of the CCC. And I made, I think, it was a, a quite easy uh, explanation about it. And the editor refuted that it, it should, I should exclude it, no one would understand. Okay, so you need sources that are understandable by other historians, and that is a, often a hard thing. And we must be able to conserve our source, which means we cannot use, this, uh, we cannot use feelings or, or memories. We can, of course, use uh, time witnesses, but that is a problem because time witnesses have um, their own bias. They have their own individual memories of an uh, event, and they tend to, to uh, be interested in history too, which means that you can interview a uh, time witness about, for example, um, the end of the Second World War, and he will know a lot of details just because he has read historic, historical books about it. And it's uh, quite a bias, you can't, you can't use this uh, source uh, in many cases. Okay, so your research question shapes the definition of what a valid, uh, valid source is, and we have to think a bit more about that. And here in this talk, I will use mostly text as a source. I will exclude time witnesses. Okay, sources that are passed on. We can distinguish two types of sources. The first type is handed on by accident. That means that they are not created with the intention to be found and evalu evaluated by historians. For example, shopping lists, that's an actual source, accounting docs, general, uh, general communication like letters, orders, log files, or and even diaries and written without, they are written without respect to history. The other type of source are intentionally passed on, and so they were created with historians in mind. Uh, that's um, mostly protocols, chronicles, inscriptions, for example, on headstones, which is a tremendously important source for um, ancient history, and of course, deeds. But if you think of uh, the second type of, oh, where it is, oh, there it is. Uh, second type, you may have noticed you can counterfeit them, and so they are oolable. And I like this example very much. Maybe you, uh, you can remember um, you can remember this uh, famous speech of Hans Peter Uhl in the Bundestag a few um, uh, months ago, where he was actually saying it's uh, it's been recorded on video that Germany is governed by security officials who are bound by the law. And when you, get, uh, when you look in the protocol, the official protocol that will go to the archives, it reads, has security officials who are bound by the public law. And so uh, you have to, to be very uh, skeptic about that. And uh, here in this case, this is a screenshot from the PDF file from the homepage, where still is, uh, wir haben Sicherheitsbeamte, we have. Um, and I think I, I'm, I should speed up a bit with my time, so I won't show you the video, but uh, look for it on YouTube. It's a sole speech where he is, uh, yeah, more or less lunatic uh, and insane what he's talking about. Okay, so let's sum up this for a moment. Is history a science at all if we have all these problems? Yes, it is, but it's of course closely connected to common sense. That's it's a really big problem of history and it's connected to political agendas. And therefore it's highly subjective. But on the other hand, we have a systematic public self-correction that's crucial for, for most sciences. For example, if you think, uh, if you, if you think of esotericism, this, this um, yeah, discipline doesn't have that. And um, still, history has an empirical basis too, and therefore it is able to change its, its views and um, to develop. Okay, just uh, by the way, can history then be a hacking tool? Um, for society, for example, after all it is, it's a tool for producing legitimacy and ident identity, and therefore if you start hacking on this to, to destroy, for example, legitimation or try to destroy identities, you, you could try to, to use history as a hacking tool, uh, and actually this will work, but it's slow, it's very slow, and it's conservative. It's quite hard to, to make an impact in history with um, yeah, revolutionary ideas. 
But on the other hand, we have encouraging examples, for example, in queer and gender or women's history, where um, uh, scholars try to show that uh, our sexual norms are subject to history and not to, to an eternal, eternal form of morality or something. So, now we can rephrase our topic to get the question more precise and have a few questions um, to, to answer. First, what kind of hacktivism, hacktivism do we mean exactly? The second is, what does, when does something matter exact, or exactly? Then, uh, on which sources could we decide this? And where do we find such, uh, such sources? And of course, we don't, must not forget the historical context found in literature. Okay. This was being hacktivism in this talk will be the activities of the CCC in the early 1980s, and in particular, VBTX hack. The next is the criteria for meta, some impact on computer crime laws. So we have to, to look for sources about uh, computer crime lawmaking and look if we find any traces about the, uh, from the BTX hack, and we can, of course, look into the media too to see if we have um, some impact there. Okay, so uh, sources are protocols from the German parliament where lawmaking is documented and of course publications from the CCC. Okay, part two. Now that we have a historical and a theoretical basis for this, we can turn to uh, historical context and look at uh, technology and society in the 1980s. And there we found that uh, technology in the 1980s was something between threat and fascination. And um, you must, have, you must keep in mind that information technology back then was quite new for most of people and it had just started to affect everyone's life. We had, for example, um, a connection to, to the peace movement in Germany that's, that's more or less specific for Germany, that's a Frankfurt school with this idea that bureaucracy and the administrative man would uh, be um, speeded up by information technology and turn out to be a new form of fascism. And we have a huge discourse about large opaque centralized, centralized systems in, in many different areas, for example, military or nuclear energy and information technology. If think, for example, of the, of the census, where we had this um, ruling of the constitutional court about the informational self-determination. And um, this was all connected to ideas that there is some anonymous, large, opaque system we don't understand where our data is collected and that can somewhat control our lives. And um, connected to this, we have, of course, uh, the hacker ethic, where uh, one sentence is to mistrust authorities and promote decentralizations. And if you connect this to this idea of centralized, large centralized systems, you will uh, immediately see the idea that centralization and authority is closely connected and has therefore to be questioned. Okay, in, in this time we had also the Green Movement and then the Green Party, which is uh, quite important uh, because most of the skepticism about uh, technology uh, culminated in this movement, and we can, we can see that the Green Party was quite, if you like, conservative against new technology uh, back then. And uh, when we try to, to uh, analyze the political spectrum a bit more, we find, um, in a short story, um, first the Stalinist Marxist left, also very, very orthodox left, uh, left wing radical parties that were technocratic and centralistic. All that uh, technology has to fulfill that is technology must be controlled by the party, the Communist Party, and then technology is a good thing. Against that, we had the altern alternative movements, the Greens, where um, technocratic and decentralism was, was uh, on the agenda. And against that, we had liberals and conservatives which were more ambivalent. Uh, they um, emphasized the uh, economic opportunities of technology, but still were a bit skeptic about that. Okay, and now try to, to place the early CCC in the spectrum. It's, it's extremely hard to do because um, the level of political interest uh, within, the, within the members of the early CCC is quite unclear, and um, mostly they, I think they have been uh, connected to each other through techno, uh, techno enthusiasm and not to a political agenda. And so they had, on the one hand, a complicated relationship to political parties, especially to the Greens, where, because the Greens were uh, very technocritic and the CCC were te uh, techno-enthusiastic. And so um, 
there, there was a large area for, for conflict. For example, um, in the 1980s, uh, the Bundestag um, decided to introduce uh, information technology in the parliament, and the Green Party was the last party to adopt the system. And the CCC tried to, to support the Green Party in adopting information technology. And um, as far as I know, it was um, disappointing for the club to, to see that the uh, uh, Greens were only able to see uh, information technology as an instrument of power and not as an instrument for, for enabling people to, to, to communicate or to do things. Okay, that's for a very short as uh, a uh, historic background. And now to part three, hacking bullshit text. Um, <laughs> Okay, as, as I told you, I will use the, the protocols of the Committee for Legal Affairs. It's a bit, oh, this talk, uh, well, this text is wrong. Okay, next slide. Sorry. Okay, let's go to, to uh, Bildschirm text. This was an, more or less, if you like, an epitome of information technology, but was, what was Bildschirm text? BTX was a communication information system that has been developed in the 1970s and deployed in the 1980s and it has very many different brands. In Germany it was BTX, in the UK Prestel and Minitel and France. And if you go outside to the, to the not the cash desk, the um, angel desk, the help desk in the middle of the room, uh, behind the glass um, you will find uh, a Minitel appliance standing there doing things uh, if you like to, to see an appliance like this uh, at work. And uh, BTX was, was operated by the uh, Deutsche Bundespost, which was uh, the tel telecommunication monopolist back at that time, and the technical operation was in Darmstadt at the Fernmelde Technisches Zentralamt. And the target of the system was consumers and companies for communications and e-commerce. So pretty much, if you like, a very early primitive version of the internet with some differences, as we will see uh, on, on, on another slide. Um, okay. Now, what did it look like? You had uh, something like this, a uh, very uh, primitive bildschirm uh, formula to, um, sorry, screen formula to, to enter your, your identification codes. Uh, the first identification code BTX number couldn't be changed. This is a part of the BTX had to change uh, this number. And uh, if you entered uh, the BTX system, you had, um, this, uh, had pages like this where you could um, access other pages with, with numbers you had to, to type in into your terminal. It's mostly like the uh, teletext system some TV sets still have. And um, the appliances looked more or less like this. You had more or less two, two different uh, types of devices. This was a standalone device, but you can also have set-up boxes for your TV sets and later on decoder cards for your computer. <coughs> So uh, something about its technical properties, as I uh, said before, it is mostly like uh, the teletext system, and it was quite slow. We had only uh, 1,200 bits per second in the beginning. And it had, uh, had a different topology in comparison to the, uh, to the internet. First of all, it clearly distinguished client server, had a central mainframe that was in the city of Ulm, and a distributed database server system, all IBM machines, and uh, consumer devices, mostly connected to TV sets. And by the way, um, you, had, you had different uh, roles, information providers and subscribers, and so you had different uh, end user devices for, for uh, those roles. And if you wanted to, to uh, edit BTX pages, you needed a much more expensive um, device for information providers or you just could simply use a um, cheaper device and drill two holes in it because it was actually the same hardware, just with uh, two buttons less installed. Okay, um, the system could perform simple animations and had a micro-payment system. This is also crucial for the beta exec. And this is, uh, excuse me for the quality, it's about the um, proliferation of BTX. And as you see, the post was uh, quite optimistic about the proliferation of BTX, and this was the reality. <laughs> I really love this graphic. And um, for example, in, in um, 1968, 1960, uh, 1987, sorry, um, the Greens uh, filed a questionnaire in the Bundestag to, to um, 
get more information about this failure. And in his response, the Minister for Post and Telecommunications had to admit that out of 400,000 BTX sets that has been ordered in 1981, only uh, 58,000 has been sold end of 19, uh, 1986. So it was, as a matter of fact, an economic failure and a catastrophe. Okay, but some people were uh, buying the sets and uh, mostly not consumers. These were reluctant. Mostly it was the CCC, of course, that were eager to use other techno enthusiasts, of course, too. And the CCC had, of course, its own service on BTX, which, was, uh, which consisted in information pages and a donation page. You could uh, access this page to, to um, uh, donate some money to the CCC, and it was, um, as far as I know, some, some fun for some people to, to go to public BTX terminals and to access this donation page, uh, billing, I think, the post for it or something, somebody else, but not yourself. So the second uh, reason for the CCC to use BTX was to highlight problems, in, for example, in data protection and security. And uh, this is all the BTX is about. And of course, the bonus post who tried to, to sell their devices tried always to downplay this, uh, such findings. So we have uh, this conflict on the one hand, the CCC trying to highlight data security problems and the bonus post trying to, to sell uh, the devices on the other hand. So um, uh, that was the context of the, of the BTX hack. And so we can, we can start to, to tell a story. Um, first of all, to, to, uh, for the BTX hack, you had to get somebody else's identification codes. And that was the HASPA, the Hamburger, uh, Hamburger Savings Bank. And um, then you had to modify your BTX decoder set. Originally, it wasn't possible to, to enter somebody else's ident codes, but if you removed the ROM chip in which the ident code was, was uh, programmed, the device just asked you for your new identification code. And um, of course, it was, it was not legal to, to open this, uh, this box. And uh, on a, a conference for data security in 1984, Paul Holland demonstrated how to open this box without, without breaking its seal. And uh, the post, of course, was, was not, not amused about that and denied the possibility for time. Okay, so after modifying your BTX decoder set for faking the husband's identity, you can access your own donation page automatically. And in this case, it means they had uh, obtained, I think it was, 135,000 marks in one night. And if you are an evil hacker, this is your money. And if you're a good hacker, you can report yourself to the data protection commissioner the other day. And then the achievement, you get a lot of att attention and embarrass your arch nemesis, in this case, the Bundespost. Um, yeah. I think Open Office just crashed. <laughs> Did you program that? Um, yeah. Give me a second. No, latte. I, I, know, I think I know what the reason is. Uh, this presenter plugin I use cannot uh, work with, with videos. Great. Um, yeah. So uh, the money transfer of 135,000 marks wasn't between actual bank accounts. It was, of course, between BTX accounts. So um, the Haspa would have um, uh, become a phone bill of 135,000 marks uh, by the Bundespost. And so you see it was quite hard, uh, would be having quite hard to gain the money at all because the Haspa would just have refuted to, to uh, pay the bill. But the interest, interesting question is how did they obtain the ID codes um, to do the hack? 
and the CCC version is that there was a security flaw in BTX. And uh, the Bundespost had another version that uh, Holland and Venary, who carried out the hack, observed the ident codes uh, during a public demonstration. And uh, actually, there is no possibility from the perspective of a historian to, to um, decide this question. We don't just have the sources about that. And um, if you want to know the truth, try to ask Venary. And of course, as you, may, uh, as you remember, it's a type 2 source, more or less, it's his memories. And uh, you can't be totally sure if he's telling the truth, of course. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at the Haspa's reaction uh, on the BTX hack. Um, normally, you would see a video on the left side, but I can't see it, uh, can't show it. That was uh, Benno Schulemann, who is a Haspa manager, who um, was talking about the diligence of these people. Um, and he was uh, opinion that one could not stress enough how uh, regrettable it was that the post couldn't be convinced before this evidence produced by these people that its BTX software does not fulfill all requirements. It's quite polite to say it this way, but I think it's, uh, it's a quote uh, showing how activism evolved in Germany. If this bank had pressed charges against Holland and Venary, uh, the press reports were quite, were have, would have been quite different. Okay, more details on the reaction on the BTX hack. We have, have seen the Haspa manager expressing his respect for the hackers, and, uh, and the most, most of the media sheared for them, uh, of course, revealing data protection flaws. Um, you can even look, for example, in the Bild Zeitung, it's a tabloid paper if you're not from Germany, and even the Bild Zeitung was uh, quite cheerful for Holland and Renary in comparison with what, what I think it's uh, because of a David versus Golia, Golia scenario here. But, uh, of course, the Bundespost tried to, to downplay the hack, and uh, first they admitted the possibility to, to um, obtain ident codes without um, um, observing them somewhere else uh, to a security flaw, which was more or less a buffer overflow hack. Uh, we don't uh, need to get into the details here. But then they, den they denied the seriousness of the hack and uh, told it was, it was more, more about um, it's the same probability to win in the lottery to have some uh, codes like this uh, obtained. Um, so, obviously, as the Bundespost told in letters to its employees, excuse me, the Haspa has been just careless. And this was a discussion in the media back then, and um, the, the uh, at first result was that the committee, committee of Post and Telecommunications blamed the uh, Bundespost for its clumsy communication politics to have admitted the possibility of the hack at first. That was the short story of the uh, BTX hack. And now let's come to the last part about computer crime lawmaking and uh, the water. So my aim at this part of my talk, at this part of my talk is to trace the BTX hack here and um, particularly in, to do this in the protocols of the Committee for Legal Affairs, the Rechtsausschuss of the German Bundestag. And uh, you can find these protocols in the archives of the German uh, Parliament, the Parliament's archive. And every, anyone who has a scientific interest in the sources can access them, but you will have to wait up to 12 years uh, to access them. As the source has to be so, uh, so old to, to get it. And um, nowadays, most uh, older protocols of the committee are edited on microfiche, um, something like microfilm, um, but you won't get the full story out of them. They are just the protocols. But if you want to read all the letters and notes exchanged between the Ministry of Justice and the uh, committee, so you have to go to, to uh, the parliament itself. And actually, they are quite nice there, but you have always a watchdog at your side. Um, there was this really nice middle-aged lady who, who sat in the archive room. I was the only uh, person to use the archive, and when I uh, went to the restrooms, he followed, he, she followed me, waited uh, before the door, and then we could go back to the um, uh, archive itself. It was quite uh, weird. And uh, oh, by the way, they don't have Wi-Fi there, so bring your um, uh, mobile card. Okay, let's go to the computer crime lawmaking itself. Around the end of the 1970s, lawmakers in the industrialized states became aware that existing laws didn't fit uh, the dawning information age. And this was especially true for the criminal code. And um, yeah. um, 
And we tend to think that uh, the criminal code is an example for uh, legal positivism, which denies the existence of crimes that are not codified by written law. But however, in this case, we could think of the criminal code as some kind of codified natural law that expresses some kind of condemnation. And so the idea was that there was, in fact, crimes that were not um, uh, addressed by the existing criminal code. So stakeholders discussed a phenomena like computer fraud and, um, for example, um, um, a crime that didn't fit under any existing law, as they said. And um, so they demanded the codification of computer crimes and hence a penalization of such behavior. Yes, that's uh, typical problems, uh, tapping data too. And they had quite, quite interesting questions in this context. For example, um, a fraud um, means to, to um, um, make a human err about something, to, to give him false information, but a computer cannot err. A computer is always right in this sense. And so uh, the traditional law couldn't, uh, couldn't address uh, this. Another, another um, problem was that results of calculations are no legal deeds. Uh, in the German law system, a deed is virtually every written document that can, can be used as, as an evidence in court. But um, the law system wants that this document can be uh, read with your eyes. And of course, calculations on, on a, um, a hard disk, for example, cannot read with your eyes. So uh, changing uh, calculations there um, are not uh, uh, a crime, to, according to the old law. That was a problem about that. So, um, about 1980, um, the lawmaker um, started to negotiate the Zweites Wirtschaftskriminalitätsbekämpfungsgesetz, <laughs> which uh, wanted to, to address uh, fighting, uh, which wanted to fight uh, white collar crimes, uh, such as some uninteresting iconic, iconic crimes like uh, fraud in the social system, something like that, but especially computer fraud, counterfeiting deeds, and tapping data destroying data or programs, and this asterisk is marked um, crimes wasn't a part of the original um, bill what entered in the negotiations, as we will see, and the necessity of this new law was not disputed by any political party. Only the Greens were skeptical about introducing new uh, laws into the criminal code, but they hadn't uh, any other idea, actually. So let's have a look at the bill in detail. And uh, it started with a draft from, from the Ministry of Justice, which only included, as I said, computer fraud and counterfeiting digital deeds, or actually changing data. And um, after hearing uh, the, the committee hold with stakeholders from committee, uh, the, uh, they extended and revised the bill. The stakeholders, of course, were uh, from industry and law enforcement, and uh, not hackers or consumer or something like that. So they had actually the chance to, to submit their personal wish list with, without any opposition. And here they demanded the introduction of norms for tapping or destroying data. Um, a bit more detail if you like. For example, this is a problem with uh, 202 STGB. STGB is a German criminal code. Um, in the traditional uh, law only applied to letters with an envelope and files on the hard disk do not have an envelope, so you need a new law for this. Another example is, as I already explained, the computer fraud and uh, the unauthorized data change because um, um, destroying material things always applied only on material things, not on digital data, which was actually just altered, not, not destroyed, if you like. Okay, so um, in this discussion we find a nice definition of hacking in the communication between, between uh, the ministry and uh, the committee, you find a letter explaining the draft from the uh, ministry, and it's, it's a really nice uh, explanation. A person fulfills, as a quote, a person fulfills the elements of the offense if he or she overcomes access guards, for example, by repeatedly typing combinations of letters and numbers on the, on the keyboard of a home computer, hacking, and as such gains access to data not designated to uh, be accessed by this person. Um, but no, <laughs> let's have a closer look at uh, discussions inside the committee. committee. And uh, as I said, they had uh, concerns about uh, the necessity uh, to extend the scope to meet the stakeholders' wishes, of course, and to discuss some, some other details of uh, newly filed by the Ministry of Justice. 
But on the October 23rd, 1985, that's the most important session of the community in, in this case, um, they first agreed on the revised draft, but then um, we find a footprint of the BTX hack, more on this later. Um, oh, by the way, uh, we have two 23s in, in this case. <laughs> Um, and um, to, to get back to the, the other slide, the Ministry of Justice had, had a clear idea of hacking. It was, had no noteworthy technological skills and was a mere trial and error by entering guest passwords. But then the committee considered that mm, maybe we should exempt good hackers and young computer enthusiasts from punishment for their beneficial work and uh, the members of the community were impressed by hacks in which hobbyists proved large companies and organization security measures to be insufficient. And then we have one case in which two members of a computer club managed to transfer a large amount of money from a bank uh, to their own account using BTX, thus providing that the DBP security guarantee was false. This is the actual place where the BTX hack um, came to, to uh, um, was discussed in the committee, committee, and even the conservatives agreed. They sympathized, Chris Democrats, they sympathized with the hackers and were impressed by their intellectual discipline. Nice to hear that, isn't it? Oh, by the way, this is the signature of the document in uh, the archive of the uh, parliament. I, I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's quite nice. You have all these long lists of numbers to, to address certain committees in different periods of the lo uh, lawmaking periods and so on. Uh, I don't know uh, who, whoever has, uh, has built this ident codes must be a drunk or something. Okay, um, we had uh, different opinions. Oh, it's a nice typo. Um, in uh, the comedy facts, first of all, it was just a hobby and we had to uh, limit this hobby to a justifiable extent. And of course, 202A STGB was so an uh, inevitable part of the new legislation, but mm, data protection issues should be a legal excuse. But on the other hand, they couldn't find a legal definition of politically correct hacking. So they tried to, to find another way and try this. They reshaped 202A STGB in the draft to make punishable tapping data, of course, but only data that is protected by some protection mechanism. And not punishable, merely logging in, breaking protection mechanisms, as long as no data is obtained. <laughs> so, uh, think of, of your favorite authentication protocol. As soon as the server acknowledges your, your login attempt, you have to enter connection and you handle problem. But this was actually no hacking, if you like. So, uh, for example, you could think that even displaying the prompt was some kind of tapping an environment variable of the system. Okay, but this version was submitted by the committee and adopted by the parliament in 1986, and the law became uh, became real law, working law. So. It was, of course, discussed in law journals. Um, and there we have the idea of a good hacker, too, of course. For example, with uh, Mr. Hafted, who was a law professor at some university, uh, who maintains impunity of hobby hobbyist hackers by uh, discussing the new law. And a person most of us know, uh, at least by name, um, some guy called Gravenreuth, distinguished in an uh, article between hackers, crackers, and crashers. So uh, the law people tried hard to, to make some sense of, of the discussion in the um, committee. And uh, all these attempts evidently were silenced. So in uh, 2007, um, Ernst underlined that these uh, attempts had virtually uh, no effect in telling good hackers from bad hackers in practice. And in a, a new uh, computer crime law, I think 2006, um, the idea that only logging in without tapping data has, should be free um, was revised and since then logging in is a crime too. So, of course, the law has uh, had uh, some impact in hacktivism too. Um, and in hackers literature, for example, in the, the case computer book, I think it's called, um, we have the idea that, uh, it, uh, that was, it was a law against hacking or was it a law only aimed at real white co uh, collar crimes with the collateral damage of hackers? And however, it was seen as a kind of a tariff list for hacking, 
how expensive is it to hack, how long you have to go for jail for something. And uh, the conclusion was, if you wanted to keep hacking, you had virtually to hack the law yourself, the, the law itself, to find ways for legal hacking. Okay, let's come to the conclusion. History, as a science and as a tool for hacking a society, is slow and conservative. And we have sometimes surprising results in the long one, in the long one, sorry, in the long one. and um, on the other hand, history of hacking is still in its, in its infancy, and there's a lot uh, more to do to, to work on this part. Second is, the BTX system was an epitome of the 1980s technology, which combined expect expectations and fears and was one place of active, <laughs> effective hacktivism that mattered. And hacktivism indeed changed the law by changing images, by creating the image of the good hacker, which was something between a consumer protector and a data protection uh, officer, and yet it was marginalized in discussions as being a mere hobby. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so far, Kai. We have now comfortable 15 minutes of, for Q&A sessions. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll come with the microphone to you. Um, and we'll switch between questions from the IRC and people here in the room. Could you um, explain in some more detail the difference between the consumer version of the BTX device and the author's version? You spoke of two keys missing. Is this the extent? Yeah. Okay. The question was uh, about the difference between the uh, consumer device uh, for BTX and the uh, provider device. Um, as far as I know, I had no chance to, to uh, play around with the hardware myself. Um, the only difference was that um, there were actually two buttons. Uh, more or less more installed at the pro, uh, provider version. So you only had to, to open the device, drill holes in it, and to install additional buttons to, to um, Löten of English? Hmm? Uh, to solder uh, to the buttons to the, to the main board, and that was pretty much it. Um, thanks for this nice overview of the history of the CCC and especially on the BTX and the history of hacking laws in Germany. I'd challenge you and bring a different um, definition of hacktivism that mm -hmm. doesn't sort of only conclude hacking that has legal consequences but uh, is limited to um, using hacking to achieve a political goal. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the history of hacktivism in that sense is also very short, but do you have any information on this? So do you see the BTX hack as um, hacktivism in the sense that it was done to achieve a political goal, or was this just a side effect of the BTX hack? Actually, I think uh, the goal of the BTX hack was to, to uh, leave political footprints. Um, I just think that Holland and Renary had um, no clue that there was such a tremendous effect in the political sphere. Um, it was more or less uh, an attempt to, to uh, let uh, their arch nemesis meet its waterloo, if you like. And when it turned out that uh, they gained so much attention for the BTX hack, they maybe, I don't know for sure, changed their mind and tried to exploit the uh, political effect. Okay, any more questions? Okay, if we don't have any more questions, please give a huge round of applause for Kai for his talk.